It's my great pleasure today to introduce you, um, Johannes Singer from Germany. Um, Johannes is currently working at the University of Hohenheim, and um, for those of you who don't know, it's in the south of Germany, it's near Stuttgart, which is a fairly big town. And Hohenheim has one, we were just talking about it, probably one of the oldest gambling institutes in Germany. It's 25 years old, and it's one of the most established ones, probably, I, I guess, along with two or three others. Um, we're very pleased that he's, uh, he's giving a speech today about his work about stigma, cessation and gambling um, from a social media kind of perspective, a quick background. So he did his, his um, studies in political and social sciences in, in uh, Würzburg in Germany, and then started his PhD four years ago. And I think you're almost ready to submit your yeah. PhD in a couple of weeks, months, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> so, and this, this, what you presented today is part of your PhD, right? Yeah, the last, the last hopefully. one. Hopefully. <laughs> and I mean, your, your main research area is probably around um, gambling and gambling marketing, especially on social media. It's great overlap with what we are also doing in Bristol. But I think it should, should be good. Rafaela, thanks for the short introduction. First of all, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for having me. I'm yeah, very delighted to have, to have the opportunity to present to you one of my last research works and also helping you with your ongoing project. As Rafaelo said, my research field lies, uh, my research interest lies in the field of gambling, advertising, and social media. So my first paper was about gambling advertising of German gambling operators on X, formerly known as Twitter, which was the first approach for German gambling operators. And the second paper was a systematic review about the marketing strategies of gambling operators. So, yeah, the focus lies on gambling advertising, the content, the characteristics, and how the marketing strategies of the operators are used in social media. This is the last paper of my uh, PhD, hopefully, stigmatization of gambling and gambling disorder in social media, a mixed methods guided topic, topic modeling approach for YouTube comments. Yeah, it's not direct about gambling advertising because the second focus of my PhD lies on the methodology by using machine learning approaches. So there was another topic around it. And it's it's the last paper of, of my PhD. So the data were collected in the end of 2022. I wrote the paper in the last year and actually it's submitted by the harm reduction journal. So the data are not that actual as a, a quick note. So at first, I thought it could be interesting to tell you something about the situation in Germany. So it's an additional point, which I call background. Then I think it's interesting why we have a look at stigmatization and why it's a big problem in yeah, battling um, gambling disorders. Then I want to tell you why it's interesting to have a look at the data from social media. Then we take, take a quick dive into the research questions. Then I want to present you my used methodology. Then we are drawing the results together and concluding it. So that's the agenda for today. So at first, if you have a look at Germany, we, Germany, we have a new regulation since 2022. Then we got the state treaty on gambling or in Germany, the Glücksspielstaatsvertrag. You know, Germans, long words, very <laughs> complex words. And it's the first uniform federal regulation, which also led to a liberalization of the German gambling market because previously illegal forms were now legalized, such as virtual slot machines or online sport betting, and also advertising is now legal for these products. But also the state treaty states that the state has the task to protect the population from gambling harm and that gambling disorders should be further reduced and that are effective player protection, especially for young people or vulnerable groups, should be ensured. And I would say keep the point in mind if you are going through the presentation, maybe that doesn't work that good at the moment. So the other data we can have a look at really quick, the turnover of the legal gambling market, that are the most recent data from 2022 are about 52 billion euros a year. It raised because of the legalization. And if you're having a look at the prevalence data, then we can see that one third of the German population participated in gambling activities in the last 12 months. So it was about 36.5%. Of them, 6.1% are having a risky gambling behavior and 2.4% of the German population are suffering from a gambling related disorder. But this is very alarming because if you, if you have a detailed look at the data, then you can see that the young people are suffering the most, 
of the young people of the 18 to 25 year olds are suffering from a gambling related or disorder and even 0.4 percent of the 16 to 17 year olds so young people are most likely to be affected by a gambling related disorder and that's a big problem so this point is mm, meh i would say at the moment so why it could be interesting to have a look at stigmatization because at first we should say what is stigmatization it's a process where an individual or a group of individuals is separated from the norm of the majority society because a certain behavior is yeah seen as deviant and is associated with negative attributions we all know stereotypes from our everyday life you can pick me for example in the first place i'm a researcher on the second hand, in my free time, I like to play video games. It's the perfect example of a nerd. <laughs> so what is attributed with a, nerd, with a nerd? I'm an introvert. I cannot socialize. And maybe I, I have some problems with body hygiene. So I hope the first point, you can see it's nonsense because I'm standing in front of you and talking to a lot of people. And the second point, yeah, OK, a window is open, so it should be not a problem. <laughs> but most of, of stereotypes are nonsense. But a negative consequence of gambling is often stigmatization, not only for people who are affected by a gambling-related disorder, but also for the regular gambler. And it's often said that these people have problems controlling themselves, they are weak, they are impulsive. And in short, it's their own fault if they are suffering from, an, from a gambling-related disorder. But another problem of this is that the consequence of stigmatization is often self-stigmatization, a process where the people affected internalize these stereotypes and really believe them themselves. And that's another problem, because if you're already suffering from a disorder and then thinking that's your own fault, then you'd be ashamed. And it's really hard to seek help and treatment if you're thinking you're the problem. So, you know, self-stigmatization is often a consequence. And these two stigmatization, the public stigmatization and the self-stigmatization of gambling are considered one of the greatest obstacles to therapy, or maybe that could be a point where we could do some prevention to get more people to seek help and treatment. And what had all this to do with social media? Yeah, in general, you all know social media. It grows continuously, connects people all around the world. At the moment, I think over 5 billion people are using the services of social media, over half of the world population. I think that's quite an impressive number. Why is that? Yeah, the requirements are getting lower, the access is getting easier, so we can connect to each other regardless of space and time, all around the world, all around the globe. And if you have a look at Germany, because we did a research exclusively for Germany, we can see that half of the population is using social media on a weekly basis, but the most active users of social media are children. 91% of them using social media on a weekly basis, and two-thirds, 68%, are using them on a daily basis of the 14 to 29-year-olds. And why is it now interesting to have a look at social media? Because they are not longer only for entertainment, just as in the beginning, they are also for information and interaction, which means they enable their users to share impressions, experiences, emotions. And most of the time, it's free data for us. It's an everyday language. It's unfiltered data, not if you have a look at the influencers, then it's not that unfiltered because of the filters, obviously. But for the carbon normal people, I would say they are unfiltered data, which we can use for scientific analysis if we have the appropriate tools. So we have a huge database. You see all the social networks over there we can use for analysis. And I brought you some examples from existing re research. We also have our emotions. We can analyze hate speech, or we can analyze stigmatization, for example. There are also some approaches out there. But I think this stigmatization approach more in the context of newspaper and hate speech. So what are the research questions? Maybe you noticed the overlapping, which I mentioned. At first, we see that young people are most affected by gambling-related disorders in Germany. But they are also the same group which are using social media the most. So maybe if we think about it and we assume that stigmatization exists in social media, then it could be 
a promising channel to reach out to the target group and do some prevention for this especially young group. So the main question was, does stigmatization of gambling and gambling related disorders exist in social media? And if it does, then how are these stereotypes are created in the everyday language of the users? The research was not about how much stigmatization we can count, what is the frequency, it is more about how it is produced or created in the everyday language. So the other questions, of course, what are the challenges of analyzing stigmatization? And yeah, there are advantage of unfiltered data of the everyday language is also a disadvantage because you all know the language in social media. It's no standard language. We have youth lang. It's not grammatically correct. We have insider knowledge. We have emojis. We have smiley. So it's really hard to work with it. Uh, with it. And there's the question, what methodology can we use to work with the data? And at this point, I want to make a little cliffhanger to the next slide, because then we dive into our methodology. And the last question is obviously, what is the direction and the intensity of the stigmatization? Here, intensity means frequency. How much is there? in comparison to other things. And the direction, it was the idea that we have a look, maybe there is the opposite of stigmatization, some support or encouraging statements from users. So the methodology we use, you saw it in the title, was a mixed methods approach by combining a qualitative content analysis with a guided topic model. And at first, if we want to collect some data from YouTube, we have to use an API. It's an access to the social network that we can collect our data. It was the YouTube API in the third version. And then we need a programming language framework where we can program our syntax and to work with our data. Therefore, we use Python. And then we dive into it. And then we are doing so-called natural language processing. That simply means that the programs which we are using are able to work with human language as it's written or speak as both. So that's in simple words. And a specific form of NLP methods is the so-called topic model or guided topic model. That's a machine learning technique that automatically analyzes text data and in simple words can identify topics to which a document belongs based on the words in the document. I was thinking a long time about giving a good example. For example, oh, that was a repetition. If you have, if you have a scientific paper and you do it into a topic model, as a simple example in the results, the topic model should say there are five topics in your paper, namely introduction, methodology, results, conclusion, and further directions, for example. So the topics which are based in the, in the document, based on the words in the document. And the specific form of a topic model or a specific machine learning technique is so-called word, word topic. If you're looking at it in detail, it's more a deep learning model than a machine learning model because it's already pre-trained with human data. I think with Wikipedia data, it is trained. And because of that, it should contain more accurate representations of words and sentences than normal topic models. And to this date, it was one of the most powerful topic models out there. At the moment, that isn't the case anymore, because if you're working with ChatGPT or Llama or Gemini, that are large language models, LMMs, which are quite better because they are working much more with, with human language. Yeah, but in simple words, can, yeah, I keep it in simple words, can assign specific keywords to different topics from our data. And the idea is now, if we are working with a topic model, that we are, that BERT acts as a filter for our collected data by filtering all YouTube comments, which can be associated with the stigmatization of gambling and gambling-related disorders in one of the same topic. So for example, if there are 10 topics in our YouTube comments we collected, then BERT comes and says, okay, N numbers of comments are in the same topic and this topic is stigmatization. That's the idea behind it. Or like the author of a topic, Grudendorf called it, word topic is a topic modeling technique that create dense clusters allowing for easily interpretable topics whilst keeping important words in the topic description. And it's also an advantage if you're working with a, with a model who has an 
an own name because if you're sitting in your office and it doesn't work how you like it, you can call it out. You don't sitting there and oh, the LDA doesn't work. You can say, oh, Bert, what are you doing with me? And then your colleagues are coming, who is Bert and what's going on? It's really funny. <laughs> Trust me, I tried it a long time. So then at first we have to collect the Eduardo for you. And I know you don't shout SPSS or Bert or something like that. It's really funny. So at first we have to collect our data from YouTube. So we used five search keywords, try to remember gambling, casino screams, gambling addiction, gambling influencer, and what did I forget? Sports betting, it were five search keywords. And then we ordered the results in chronological descending orders, the top 10 videos for each we picked. If they were in German language, because as I said, we wanted to do it for German language, and if there was a minimum of 1,000 comments, because otherwise the database would be too small for our algorithm to work with it. So in the end, we had 34 videos because there weren't that much videos in German language, but very interesting with about 1,000 comments. So we only had 34 videos with about 84,000 comments. I'm sorry, quick question. When you say top videos, you mean number of views or likes? A few, sorry, okay. yeah, a few. Thank you. I forgot. But then we did our data optimization and we had a quick review of our videos and we really fast noticed that a lot of the titles were misleading, that a lot of videos have titles with gambling or sports betting in it, but the content wasn't about completely other stuff. So we did a quick review. And in the end, really decided to only pick two videos for the analysis because they were really good. Because in the first video, they are from the same channel. It was an interview with a person who has successfully overcome a gambling addiction. And he was talking over the whole duration of the video about his experiences with fighting this, this addiction. And in the second video, it was the same person who was discussing with a forming casino operator and they were clashing in the discussion. It was really interesting, but these both videos act as a really productive input for the comment sections because the users really started to discussing about whose fault is it, was is it with gambling addiction, etc. So we decided to only take these two videos here you can see the comments and here was the quick review how much the content was about gambling and how long of the time the person with the gambling, who has uh, successfully overcome the gambling disorder can be seen in the video. So we ended up with two videos and 11,813 comments. Yeah, one limitation is the small number, but I want to mention here again that our aim was not to count how many stigmatization is here, but to say how it is created in everyday language. So we don't need this big database. I think it should be okay. Then quickly, before we can work with the data, we have to bring them into a form that our algorithm can work with. So we're doing the tokenization or the pre-processing. So we are reducing noise in the data. We are throwing nonsense out. So for example, blanks, URLs, numbers, single letters, short sentences, short words, um, stop words, and or but they have because they have no semantic meaning in this way. And then in the end, we are doing a lemmatization. It's hard to explain, but I think it's like you're bringing all words into the basic form, like the word stem. For example, if you have the word to go, then you have go, going, went, gone, and then the lemmatization change all of these words into go into the basic form that your algorithm is not confused by the different forms. But to doing lemmatization with German is interesting. There's only one package out, which programmed one PhD uh, student, I think, for himself because the other packages weren't that good. So he had enough of it, and I do it myself, and it was the only package who worked in a, a semi-good way, I would say. <laughs> so our final data set, our final corpus consists out of 9,451 9, tokens in this case, the comments in the single form. And then you have two options. The first is you pipe all your data into your algorithm and do a topic modeling approach. 
But here we saw really fast that it's really hard for BERT to work with the data. So we decided to do a guided topic modeling approach and therefore we were creating a stigma dictionary. Stigma di or dictionaries in general are a common form for the recognition of linguistic phenomena in text data. So you, as the model in the end, says we are guiding our model in the right direction. So we tell our model what we know about stigmatization or what terms in this case can be already associated with the stigmatization of gambling and gambling related disorder. But where you can get some terms, of course, you have a look at the existing research approaches. But yeah, that was really interesting because we found 19 terms in the existing research literature which can be associated with the stigma of gambling and gambling related disorder, but only three of them were in our collected data. And we think it's the exact problem because we are using everyday language because the research data exclusively works with surveys or interviews and most of the time it's standard language. So our data hasn't any standard language so we cannot find them in our data. And then we were thinking about hmm, how we can widen our basis for our dictionary. And the idea was to work with embeddings. So the embedding is the semantic field of a word. You can imagine like this, you're looking at a word and are looking what words are around that word in our data with a similar meaning in a similar context. So like synonyms. So you're looking for synonyms in, in, in simple words. So in our first step, we are added some additional terms to have more terms, which we can looking for embeddings. And that is in the end, our table. At first, you can see the three terms from the existing research literature, which are in our data, foolish, naive, and stupid. And then we added these four additional terms, addiction, addicted, gambling, addicted, and gambling, addict. And then on the right side, you can see the 10 top embeddings for each of these terms. And the terms that are in bold, we decided or we assumed they also can be associated with stigma of gambling and gambling related disorder. Except the last line, that's what I meant with the direction. Here we assume that it's the opposite because we have really positive words like honest, strong, respect, honesty. So we created two dictionaries. You can see them here. So we created not a normal dictionary. We call it an extended stigma dictionary because we have more terms. In the end, we ended up with 16 terms and we created a support dictionary with honest, respectful, desirable, sympathetic, honesty, and strong. And now these dictionaries are working as a guide for our topic model. But now you can argue, hmm, but you force your model to looking after this word and put it in the same topic, but it's not the case with BERT. It's, it's not forcing your model, it's like pushing your model in a direction. So for example, I want, I want to try to explain it. If you have a comment, for example, with the word foolish and, in, and addicted, then BERT thinks, okay, that could be in topic one, for example, and could be associated with the stigmatization of gambling and gambling related disorder. And if you have another comment with naive gambling addict and weakness, then we'll also assume it's in the same topic, topic one. But, and we really saw that in the data, we had the case that there was stupid, addicted and alcohol in it. Then the model bird put it in another topic because he can uh, differentiate between these words. So we do not force the model to do so. It's only a nudge in the right direction and it worked quite well for these to different, differentiate. So yeah, in the end, if we defined all the stuff that would most of the word work, then we put our data in and then it's a really quick thing. At first, sadly, of our around about 9,000 comments, word created 5,245 outliers, which means that are tokens or comments that cannot be assigned to any topic because, for example, they are too short, there is not enough information in it. But it's a common problem if you're working with data from social media. But 4,206 comments, Bird was able to assign to 10 topics. And I brought you the two most important topics, topic zero and topic six. So the topics are also uh, ordered in chronological descending order, which means Topic 
zero contains the most comments and the get comment, uh, the topic with the with the um, smallest amount of um, comments was topic nine in this case and we can assume that topic zero can be associated with the stigmatization of gambling and gambling related disorder we don't know it we have to interpret the results of our model so yeah it's you have to do it yourself. And we also assume that topic six can be associated with the opposite of stigmatization. So in the end, we had 850 comments in topic zero, which is 20% of our 4,200 comments, which could be associated to any of these topics. And for the support topic, we had 335 comments, which represents 8% of the data. And then, because it's a mixed method approach, we validated these outcome manually via content analysis. So a colleague of mine, we are coding these 1,185 comments from the two topics manually. Cohen's cover was okay. It was about uh, every time over 0 0.9. So totally fine, the interrater reliability. But what you can see here is that we have inaccuracies between per topic and our qualitative analysis because the agreement is only 78% and 50%. So what to do with this information? Yes, of course, it's a limitation, but I have to mention it again. Our aim was not to, to see how much stigmatization is there. Our aim was to see if stigmatization exists in social media and if so, how it is produced in everyday language and therefore the model was quite okay. And to have a look at it, I brought you some of the stereotypes, but you can say they are already known of the existing research. At first, there were, were a lot of personal insights like users wrote people who are affected by a gambling related disorder. Yeah, are stupid, are dumb, are weak, are impulsive. They are only blaming others for their own problems, but it's their own fault. They easily can stop if they want to because they don't want to take responsibility. It's only the, the faults of themselves and not from others. And then there were also two libertarian talking points that some people wrote, yeah, maybe we cannot save or protect everybody because otherwise we have to restrict the freedom of all members of the society and some users already or even got so far that they are saying there is no such such thing as addiction it's only idea of the government or of science to oppress the community etc yeah. nonsense and lastly and that was really sad to read I have to say there was self-stigmatizing comment where user wrote that they have successfully overcome a gambling addiction, but they used the statements to amplify the other stereotypes by saying, yeah, I have successfully, successfully overcome the addiction and now I know that it was my own fault. And that was really hard to read. We don't know if they were right, if it was trolling, but it was there and what really said. So I would say in the end, what is the main point here? We see that a lot of users don't understand how addiction works because they're thinking it, it's a rational choice. But the first point to come with an addiction is the loss of control. And, and the positive point on the other side was, if you remember topic six, there were a lot of positive comments. So encouraging statements like keep fighting, you can do it. There is treatment, stay strong it will be good in the end. It was nice to read. So in the end, we can conclude that yes, stigmatization of gambling and gambling-related disorder is present in social media, and our mixed method approach was able to identify different stereotypes. And maybe social media is a promising channel to reach out to the target group in case of young people. And I think out of the literature, there are two things we can do. At first, education is needed about how stigmatization works to destigmatize gambling in the first place and prevent self-stigmatization in the second place, because we also know that they are great obstacles to therapy. So if we are battling stigmatization, maybe more people would seek help and treatment. And for those persons affected, it's necessary that they can see that treatment is available, that recovery is possible, 
and that seeking help and treatment is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. And to the end, because I, I presented the preliminary results as a poster at the Kagor conference in last year, and I was talking to, to people with lived experience, and I think a single step for every one of us could be in our everyday lives that we're not talking about problem gamblers, but talking about people with a gambling related disorders because the problem is not the person but the addiction and I was thinking about it all the time and I try to do it in my presentation and in my written text to speaking in this other way and that was it thank you very much for having me your questions and suggestions are welcome and at the end I have a picture of our institute <laughs> but yeah, it looks really cool, but my office is yeah back here. There, it isn't that cool, but I need to shine a little bit. So thank you very much.